I understand now why I created such an alliance a few months ago with BetterHelp. Those of you that are feeling extremely anxious and you feel the need for someone to talk to, there's a link in the bio to BetterHelp. I think they're the largest online counseling agency, licensed counselors, someone that you can have help you through these difficult and anxious times. There's a link in the description. If that's something you feel like you need, I want you to call or link up with them and let's press our way through this. But in the meantime, know that we love you, we're praying for you, and as a nation, as a world, really, we're gonna get through this together. Let's talk. Let's talk. You don't know how to be an individual. And we want to get back to our discussion on race relations in the United Let's States. Plus, Pastor R.C. Blake's Jr. joining us. And as leaders on a local level, when we begin to combat the rhetoric with truth. Pastor, thank you so much for joining me. It's such a horrific conversation that we even have to be having. What are you hearing from? Let's Our subject is in the form of a question. Why do we love people who do not love back? That's, a, that's an ongoing theme in my life and in my ministry. Um, not only because it's something that people constantly ask me about, but this is also an issue that I have had in my own life. <clears throat> where I have uh, made more deposits in certain relationships than withdrawals. This is an issue I've had in my own life where uh, I've loved people more than they love me back. And then they almost blame me for whatever, you know, madness went on. But why, why do we do this? You know, in, in a lot of cases, uh, invite people to come into this because this is a necessary discussion. In a lot of cases, um, it's due to toxic religion. You know, somehow we have concluded that to be saved is uh, synonymous with being a doormat. That because I'm saved, I'm supposed to, you know, just, just hang in here and take it and take it and take it and and let the whole world just abuse me over and over and over again. And I'm supposed to just, uh, you know, keep right along. But when you read the scripture and you really read it with, you know, fresh eyes and you're not reading it out of the context of your religious conditioning, you'll find over and over again where, where God creates balance between, you know, how we love people and uh, them loving us back. And we're supposed to be wise enough to be able to discern if um, we're making more deposits than we are withdrawals, or if they're making more withdrawals from the relationship than they're making deposits. And then we're supposed to be wise enough to make adjustments. See, I can love you just from a, a different distance. I don't have to love you up close. I don't have to give you access to my whole life for me to love you. I can love you between here and China if that's necessary. But look, look what the Bible says in Matthew 10 and 14. And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Don't, don't sit there and beg them to hear you, beg them to receive you beg them to love you, beg them to appreciate you, he says, it is what it is, recognize it, shake off the dust from your feet, keep it moving, take every, every uh, thing that I've given you and, and bring it with you. In uh, Luke 6, it says, blessed are ye when men shall, listen to this, this is interesting, if I can get back to it, blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. So he's saying you're blessed when men hate you, don't love you back, cast you out of their company. You know, sounds like Jesus is saying it's nothing to have a nervous breakdown about, you're good. Three things I wanna talk about tonight. 
relative to this question, why do we why do we love people who do not love back? Number one, I'll jump right in for the sake of time. Number one, uh, as I pondered this, we're snared by rejection. You see, initially in, in, a, in, a, in a toxic relationship, in a bad friendship, in a bad love affair, in a bad marriage, uh, in a bad parental child relationship or vice versa, initially rejection is like introduced into our lives while we are unaware of what's happening. You know, you're, you're embracing this relationship and you're thinking in your, you know, in your mind that this is going to be awesome. This is going to be leave it to beaver type awesome. And so rejection introduces itself into our lives while we are unaware. And in fact, while we are expecting the exact opposite. By the time rejection has done its work on our self view, our self esteem, and our personal estimation, it has rearranged our internal settings to abnormal, dysfunctional. Rejection is like um, a virus, to use some um, popular language now. Rejection is like a virus that depletes the soul of all the antibodies necessary to fight the rejection off. Rejection leaves us longing for the very thing that's killing us because it creates a deficient soul. And rejection to a deficient soul becomes as an addiction. When your mind, your will, and your emotions have been depleted, the rejection becomes as an addiction. When your soul is deficient, rejection becomes addictive. Now, a deficient soul is a soul that is out of sync with God and unaware of God's unique value and purpose. A deficient soul is a soul that is out of sync with God and it is unaware of God's unique value and purpose that he has placed upon the soul itself. A deficient soul is a person with a broken consciousness who is expecting others to repair them. Now, when a person has not been nurtured and love completely, there resides a void in the soul, which makes the soul deficient. Along with that void comes a desperate desire to have that area, area filled. This desperation creates a sort of panic that turns off the intelligence and turns down the voice of the Holy Spirit discernment. The person then proceeds to make a total investment, watch this, of love and energy into the first person that shows up in his or her life. They just want to love them because the rejected soul feels like I can love you into loving me back. Now, when the relationship begins to go in a direction that is obviously toxic, the victim is incapable of distinguishing between abuse versus normal behavior. That's how rejection breaks the soul. It breaks the soul to the point that there's no more discerning between what is good or bad, what is right or wrong, what is proper or improper. Rejection and abuse have now at this point become the norm. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now rejection is like a drug that gets introduced to the soul 
and becomes an addiction. Watch this. We don't want it. We realize the detriment of it, but we don't know how to break free from the ironic attraction to the thing and person that does to us the greatest harm. It's like a drug addict, you know? Drug addict knows that the heroin is not good, but he knows he doesn't even want it, but you know he doesn't need it, but he doesn't want it, but he wants it. He got to have it, you know? And he's sad once he gets it. And, and rejection does that to the soul. When a person has not been nurtured and loved properly, uh, and, and an individual comes into that person's life and they introduce rejection, rejection becomes a toxic bond. The person knows that this is not good for me, I don't even want this, but somehow I keep reaching for it. Somehow I don't know how to pull away from it. Somehow in the back of my mind, I'm believing that this is all I'm worth. This is all I deserve. Now, letter A under rejection. Why? Why does rejection do this to us? Number, letter A, re rejection bruises the ego. All of us have one. Rejection bruises the ego, which causes the victim to return for more to satisfy the need for human validation and to appease the twisted measure of value that the victim has attached to the rejecter's validation. In other words, when I reject you, there's something that it bruises your ego and there's something in you when, when you're not fully invested into the things of God and, you're, and you've not been developed in terms of your soul to be able to kick out stuff that should not even have, a, have an audience in your mind, when I reject you, there's something in you that says, uh, I have to make him accept me because he's the one. Now, you may have a whole line around the block of people that are ready to take my place to be substitutes, but there's something that happens in the mind of the victim that you have to have, you have to have the, the person that actually did the rejecting to be the one to actually accept you. And there's something that you've attached to the, to the, um, to the victimizer there's a validation that you would feel if the victimizer accepts you that you won't you won't you won't have that sense of validation from anyone else. Watch this. Not even will you have that validation from God, because in your mind, you need the person that did the crime to be the one to show up and to bring closure. And they bring closure by what? Finally affirming you. When you look in Genesis um, 29, I'll just mention it uh, because I'm going to read it again. 32 through 35, there you see um, the, the story of Leah. And I talk about it all the time. Leah and Rachel were married to Jacob. He loved Rachel. He hated Leah. And, and Leah just bent over backwards trying to get Jacob to affirm her, trying to get Jacob to accept her. I mean, she went to unbelievable lengths because she was struggling. She kept on luck, pouring her love out on somebody that did not love her back because she was struggling with rejection. Uh, let her be under rejection. We have, uh, we have many times relational ideals that we desperately strive to satisfy, even though those ideals were never shared by the other person. It's hard for you to process. You're snared by rejection. It's hard for you to process because you had one idea about what this was going to be. It was the ideal idea, but the thing you failed to do was to discern if the individual that you were pouring all of this, making all of this investment into this emotional investment into you failed to discern if that person had the same idea or shared the same ideals. 
And so you gave and gave and gave. Let me read this. When we have, when, when we have these broken ideals, we tend to take it personally when the relationship does not go in the direction of the ideal. This is why it's hard for people to let go of bogus marriages or bogus relationships. When you get into it and you thought that the other person was really all in like you and you discover that they're not. Well, let me finish reading this. He says, uh, I'm, it says when, when we have these broken ideals, we tend to take it personally when the relationship does not go in the direction of the ideal. This also creates a mental block that won't allow us to accept the reality. Can't accept this because this is not what I saw. We are addicted to the fantasy ideal. When Amos 3 and 3 clearly tells us that, you know, ask the question, can two walk together except they be agreed? We were never agreed in the beginning, but because we were carried away with this fantasy ideal, we just brushed all that other stuff under the rug. We, we ignored red flags and we just went all, you know, full steam ahead. And then we got in the middle of it. And when it was time to put up or shut up, we realized that the other person did not bring to the table what we brought. And so now the rejection, you know, is messing with the ideal that I had in my mind. This was supposed to be it. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16 in the um, ASV version, it says, Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers for what fellowship of righteousness with uh, righteousness and iniquity or what common a communion hath light with darkness and what concord hath Christ with Belial or what portion hath a believer with an unbeliever. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For we are, we are a temple of the living God, even as God said, well, you get the point, you know? You have this ideal, but you're connecting, you're trying to come into covenant with somebody who never shared your ideal, nor did they share your ideas. But now the, the ideal in your mind won't allow you to accept the obvious rejection. So you can't dust your feet because your mind is on a chain. Your brain is on a chain and your mind is on a lock and it's connected to a fantasy ideal. And then let us see under rejection, we have an expected return on our investment into the relationship. We, we, we can't accept the rejection. We're snared by the rejection because We've made such an investment into, you know, the first thing people want to talk about when they have these toxic relationships is how much time they've spent there, how many years I've been here, you know, all I've put into it and so forth and so on. It's like you're discounting the time that you have left for the time that you've wasted. And I hate to be so blunt about it, but the time that you've wasted on something bogus somebody that never was reciprocal, you're willing to sacrifice what you got left because of what you've wasted. It's like the gambler that sits at the, at the, at the machine and, and spends $9,000, loses $9,000 and goes back up to his room and sees the last $1,000 sitting on the desk or the table. And rather than clutching to that and appreciating that and valuing it, he says, well, I've, I've put, I've lost nine. I may as well lose. That's a sick brain. So, so number one, we, we love people who, who do not love back because we are snared by, um, we're snared by, by rejection. Rejection becomes like a drug that keeps pulling us, calling us back and taking more and more and more away from us. Number two, we are suffering from toxic empathy. I only have three and then I'm out. We're suffering from toxic empathy. Empathy is that, that ability to be able, that normal people have, uh, to be able to feel another person, to, you know, uh, feel for another person, to emotionally put yourself in another person's shoes, to be able to be empathetic, to be loving, to be caring, you know, what normal people have. 
what narcissists lack and do not possess, the ability to feel for others and to uh, give to others when they're in need. But then there's this thing called toxic empathy. Toxic empathy, this is when one person over identifies with somebody else's feelings and issues. The person, the toxic empath literally takes the other person's stuff on as their own. They go as far as to even accept the blame for the other person's behavior in the relationship. You, 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 you make excuses for why that person abuses you. Oh, he beat me up because I, I popped off at the mouth. Come on now. It's toxic empathy. It's empathy to the point that you abuse yourself to appease others. It's where you dismiss yourself to cling to others. It's where you become a self abuser. Now an empath is one that is the exact opposite, as I said, of a narcissist. They not only feel the pain and emotion of others, they absorb and internalize it when that empathy becomes toxic. And some of you are struggling with that. You keep on attracting people that don't love you back because you're identified as a toxic empath. You are a person that will hurt yourself to appease others, not just those that, you know, it's not like you just overextending yourself and, and you're sacrificing for those that love you back, but you're a person that take people who are snakes and you give them everything you got and anybody else's who will lend it to you and you keep on attracting these kinds of people because you are a toxic empath. Now, healthy empathy, you got to understand this, and I'm challenging some of y'all's toxic religion right now. Healthy empathy has boundaries and limits. Toxic empathy has no limitations and will drive the empath to self-destruction. When I say healthy emp empathy has boundaries and limits, I mean loving a person should not be limitless. A person should not just be able to do anything to you and you're just going to still be there pouring yourself into that. There are limits. There are boundaries. I mean, if you're well-adjusted and healthy, there has to be boundaries. You, you just can't sit there and anything goes and people can just walk into your life and wreck your life over and over and over again. And you still sitting there with your arms wide open talking about come do it to me again. And then blame that on God, blame that on the Bible, blame that on spirituality. It may be spiritual, but it ain't got nothing to do with the Holy Ghost. Look, listen to what the Bible says in Matthew 10, 37. He that loveth father, now pay attention to the wording. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, now you got to pay attention to the wording. He that loveth father, father or mother more than me is not worthy. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy. The message that Jesus is indirectly communicating is that there must be limits and boundaries on even the most intimate relationships to maintain spiritual or divine balance. You should love no one where there are no limits, where there are no boundaries. And there are too many of us who have been broken to the point that we have erased the boundaries. We have eliminated the limits and people are just ramshacking our lives and we're praying and we're asking God to do something. And the reality is that that's, in your, that's within your jurisdiction. Jesus says, you got to even have limits. If you're going to stay in balance with me, you got to have limits with mother and fathers. You got to have limits even with sons and daughters. Okay, letter A, people with toxic empathy. You take on the responsibility for fixing other people's issues. 
This goes from giving them money that you can't afford to staying in a relationship that doesn't fulfill you, but it makes them happy. So you, because you're a toxic empath, you stay because you don't want to make them unhappy. Second Thessalonians three and 10 says, for even when we were with you, this, we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. But how many toxic empaths are spoon feeding people? taking care of people that won't lift a finger for you. And then you blame this on God. Let it be. You feel guilty for choosing your heart and don't know how to say no to them. You know, you know that you want to go in a different direction, but you just don't know how to say no. It's kind of like that uh, young prophet in first Kings 13 uh, you can write, look at verses 15 through 22. I won't read it for the sake of time, but I'll tell you the story. God gave a young prophet a, a certain instruction, told him, go in, give the word, come out. Don't stop at nobody's house. An old false prophet caught him and said, the Lord told me to get you and bring you home. He didn't know how to say no. He went home with the old prophet. And while he's sitting at the old prophet's table, the old prophet pronounces, because you didn't obey God, you're going to die. And he He died. He was a toxic him. He did not know how to say no. Toxic empaths do not know how to say no. Your heart is saying one thing, but your mouth always says, says something different. Let us see. You create an identity in serving them. In other words, it becomes codependent. You don't know what you would be. You, you don't know what your identity is apart from this toxic, dysfunctional relationship. So you hang on to it because it's where you find your identity. This is where you actually need to meet other people's needs to feel personally fulfilled. Now let me get out of here. Number three, third reason that we love people that do not love back. We're caught up in that, um, we're snared by rejection. We're caught up in toxic empathy. And then number three, we're caught in the approval trap. And I kind of alluded to it. You're caught in the approval trap. The approval trap is where you have a psychological need for the same person that rejected you to accept you. The approval trap is where you have a need for the same person that opened the wound to stitch you up. You become obsessed with the acceptance and the validation of the very person that broke you. So it doesn't matter that God sends a, a tremendous stepfather into your life doesn't matter that you have a stepfather that is ideal loves you unconditionally provides for your sacrifices for you is every example you need in the world in your in your soul your soul is so broken you can't get beyond the dude that donated the seed to recognize that god has already met the need in your stepfather you're caught up in the approval trap because the person that broke me, I'm only valid if they come back and repair me. Going back to Leah in uh, Genesis 29, 31 through 35. Man, you read the full chapter. You just keep on reading. She kept on having baby after baby after baby. She took a break and then she gave Jacob a... Uh, one of her maids or something so he could make babies with her. Then she came back, start having more babies for him. Caught up in the approval trap. Now, the person that broke you does not possess the depth to heal you. The best thing you can do with the person that broke you is forgive them and move forward with your life. 
unless God has done something radical in them and they've grown. Other than that, the best thing you can do is to forgive them and move forward with your life because once you get caught up in that approval trap where your mind gets locked in on, I need the person that did me wrong to say they're sorry. I need the person that did me wrong to come back and to finally do me right. And the Bible says in Proverbs uh, 29, 25, and 26, it says the fear of man bring, bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Safe. Many seek the ruler's favor, but every man's judgment cometh from the Lord. Never get caught up in the approval trap, needing the, meaning the approval of men. The only approval you need is the approval of your heavenly father. And when you have that, man's approval matters not. So let me pray for you tonight. Father, I thank you for just the revelation to even address, address this issue at this time. And Father, now my prayer is that you will give every person watching this and even those that will watch the replay the strength to be able to pull through this, to recognize these issues and to put these things into divine order because it is not your will, God, that we would be slaves in this way. And so it's in Jesus' name that we thank you for total victory. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. One of the things I'm most proud of is the way my message relative to Queenology has rolled out and is yet expanding and increasing. I am really excited about it. You know, the, the staple of what I do and who I am is centered around the empowerment of women that uh, have been broken by society, broken by uh, systems and traditions that uh, have emptied the self-esteem bank and robbed the woman of her consciousness. And if this is your first time ever seeing me, you know that, uh, or you should know that I wrote this book, uh, Queenology. This book is written to uh, a woman who is in search of who she really is. Then uh, we also created the study guide to go along with it. And I'm excited about these works, but along with these, I have also created, I haven't talked about it much, but I've also created an online course that extends the conversation. The book and the study guide deal with what I call the five tenets of Queenology. But the, the, the online course takes the conversation even further and even deeper. It's a compilation of many of the messages that I've done randomly on social media. For instance, session one, there are 10 sessions to the online course. It's about seven or eight hours of content. Session one, the unconscious queen. Session two, your throne is a terrible thing to waste. Session three, becoming comfortable in your crown. Session four, the daily habits of a conscious queen. Session five, adjusting your mindset as a mature queen. When you get to that age where, you know, society says your value has diminished, what a lie. How do you adjust your mindset as a mature queen? Number six, or session six, queens in business success. Session seven, seven things a queen conscious woman never does with a man. Session eight, how queens love their kings. Session nine, queens ask questions. And session 10, a queen's self-work. Now, the thing I'm most excited about is that along with the, the, the 10 sessions, we have also created a 113 page PDF downloadable workbook just like I have for the physical book but this is a workbook that is centered around the content for the online course it's 113 pages and you have access to that you'll be able to download it all of it at one time and put it into a binder or 
or you can download it as you go. After every session, I suggest that you do the work that's in the workbook. The work that you will do inside of the a study guide for the online course includes key scriptures, principles to remember, questions to answer, actions to take, and then we have personal declarations that we make after each session. So I'm extremely excited about uh, how Queenology is evolving. I'm extremely excited about the online course, the book, the study guide. I'm extremely excited and I have plans for the future that I'll tell you about at a later date. But right now, I want you to go to rcblakes.com and I want you to purchase this online program. I promise you, it's going to change your life.